Good evening, friends, fiends, and night owl supremes. Welcome to A Bit Late. Mwahahaha. Tonight we are continuing our chilling classic ghost story, none other than Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, Part 2. So, welcome back. It's still chilly, so it's still the perfect time to be reading the story. So make sure you have your blankets handy, tea, coffee, cocoa, and summon animal familiars aplenty for our spooky dive into tonight's story. Last we read, we got a frightful amount of setup. Douglas had gathered a curious group around the fire in an old house to tell the story of Bly out of a precious red and gilt manuscript. We, through the governess, meet Mrs. Gross and little Flora, who's gorgeous apparently, and get a grand little tour of the big house, which feels like a ship adrift at sea, it seems. We also learn that young Miles has been kicked out of school and that the previous governess has died. Mysteriously. And that's about as much as Mrs. Gross will add on, which is exactly where we left off. So, if you want to continue turning this tale, follow me into The Turn of the Screw, Part 2. Mwahaha. The Turn of the Screw, Chapter 3. Her thus turning her back on me was fortunately not, for my just preoccupations, a snub that could check the growth of our mutual esteem. We met after I had brought home little Miles more intimately than ever on the ground of my stupefaction. So monstrous was I, then ready to pronounce it that such a child as had now been revealed to me should be under an interdict. I was a little late on the scene, and I felt, as he stood wistfully looking out for me before the door of the inn at which the coach had put him down, that I had seen him, on the instant, without and within, in the great glow of freshness, the same positive fragments of purity in which I had, from the first moment, seen his little sister. He was incredibly beautiful, and Mrs. Gross had put her finger on it. Everything but a sort of passion of tenderness for him was swept away by his presence. While wow, these children are magnetic. Dang. What I then and there took him to my heart for was something divine that I had never found to the same degree in any child. His indescribable little air of knowing nothing in the world but love. It would have been impossible to carry a bad name with a greater sweetness of innocence. And by the time I had got back to Bly with him, I remained merely bewildered, so far that is, as I was not outraged, by the sense of the horrible letter locked up in my room in a drawer. As soon as I could compass a private word with Mrs. Gross, I declared to her that it was grotesque. She promptly understood me. You mean the cruel charge? It doesn't live an instant, my dear woman. Look at him. She smiled at my pretension to have discovered his charm. I assure you, miss, I do nothing else. What will you say then? She immediately added. In answer to the letter, I had made up my mind. Nothing. And to his uncle? I was incisive. Nothing. And to the boy himself? I was wonderful. Nothing. She gave with her apron a great wipe to her mouth. Then I'll stand by you. We'll see it out. We'll see it out, I ardently echoed, giving her my hand to make it a vow. She held me there a moment, then whisked up her apron again with her detached hand. Would you mind, miss, if I use the freedom to kiss me? No. Oh. I took the good creature in my arms, and after we had embraced like sisters, felt still more fortified and indignant. This, at all events, was for the time, a time so full that, as I recall it, the way it went, it reminds me of all the art I now need to make it a little distinct. What I look back at with amazement is the situation I accepted. I had undertaken with my companion to see it out, and I was under a charm, apparently, that could go smooth away the extent and the far and difficult connections of such an effort. I was lifted aloft on a great wave of infatuation and pity. I found it simple in my ignorance, my confusion, and perhaps my conceit to assume that I could deal with a boy whose education for the world was all on the point of beginning. I am unable even to remember at this day what proposal I framed for the end of his holidays and the resumption of his studies. Lessons with me indeed that charming summer, we had a theory that he was to have, but I now feel that for weeks the lessons must have been rather my own. I learned something at first, certainly, that had not been one of the teachings of my small smothered life. Learn to be amused and even amusing and not to think for the morrow. It was the first time in a manner that I had known space and air and freedom, 
all the music of the summer and the sweet mystery of nature. And then there was consideration, and consideration was sweet. Oh, it was a trap, not designed, but deep, to my imagination, to my delicacy, perhaps to my vanity, to whatever in me was most excitable. The best way to picture it all is to say that I was off my guard. They gave me so little trouble. They were of a gentleness so extraordinary. I used to speculate, but even this with a dim disconnectedness, as to how the rough future, for all futures are rough, would handle them and might bruise them. They had the bloom of health and happiness, and yet, as if I had been in charge of a pair of little grandees, of princes of the blood, for whom everything to be right would have to be enclosed and protected, the only form that, in my fancy, the after years could take for them was that of a romantic, a really royal extension of the garden and the park. It may be, of course, above all, that what suddenly broke into this gives the previous time a charm of stillness, that hush in which something gathers or crouches. The change was actually like the spring of a beast. Oh no, here we go, hello. In the first few weeks, the days were long. They often, at their finest, gave me what I used to call my own hour. The hour when, for my pupils, tea time and bedtime having come and gone, I had before my final retirement a very small interval alone. Much as I liked my companions, this hour was the thing in the day I liked most, and I liked it best of all when, as the light faded, or rather, I should say, the day lingered and the last calls of the birds sounded in a flush sky from the old trees, I could take a turn into the grounds and enjoy, almost with a sense of property that amused and flattered me, the beauty and dignity of the place. It was a pleasure at these moments to feel myself tranquil and justified, Doubtless, perhaps, also to reflect that by my discretion, my quiet good sense and general high propriety, I was giving pleasure, if he ever thought of it, to the person to whose pressure I had responded. What I was doing was what he had earnestly hoped and directly asked of me, and that I could, after all, do it proved even greater a joy than I had expected. I dare say I fancied myself, in short, a remarkable young woman, and took comfort in the faith that this would more publicly appear. Well, I needed to be remarkable to offer a front to the remarkable things that presently gave their first sign. It was plump one afternoon in the middle of my very hour. The children were tucked away and I had come out for my stroll. One of the thoughts that, as I don't in the least shrink now from noting, used to be with me in these wanderings was that it would be as charming as a charming story suddenly to meet someone. Someone would appear there at the turn of a path and would stand before me and smile and approve. Hmm. I didn't ask more than that. I only asked that he should know, and the only way to be sure that he would know would be to see it, and the kind of light of it in his handsome face that was exactly present to me, by which I mean the face was when, on the first of these occasions at the end of a long June day, I stopped short of emerging from one of the plantations and coming into view of the house. What arrested me on the spot, and with a shock much greater than any vision had allowed for, was the sense that my imagination had, in a flash, turned real. He did stand there, but up high, beyond the lawn, at the very top of the tower which, on that first morning, little Flora had conducted me. This tower was one of a pair, square, incongruous, crenellated structures that were distinguished for some reason, though I could see little difference as the new and the old. They flanked opposite ends of the house and were probably architectural absurdities, redeemed in a measure indeed by not being wholly disengaged nor of a height too pretentious, dating in their gingerbread antiquity from a romantic revival that was already a respectable past. I admired them, had fancies about them, for we could all profit in a degree, especially when they loomed through the dusk by the grandeur of their actual battlements. Yet it was not such an elevation that the figure I had so often invoked seemed most in place. Dun dun dun. It produced in me, this figure in the clear twilight, I remember, two distinct gasps of emotion, which were, sharply, the shock of my first and that of my second surprise. My second was a violent perception of the mistake of my first. The man who met my eyes was not the person I had perceptively supposed. There came to me thus a bewilderment of vision which, after these years, there is no living view that I can hope to give. An unknown man in a lonely place is a permitted object of fear to a young woman, and the figure that faced me was, a few more seconds assured me, 
as little anyone else I knew as it was the image that had been in my mind. I had not seen it in Harley Street. I had not seen it anywhere. The place, moreover, in the strangest way of the world, had, on an instant, and by the very fact of its appearance, become a solitude. To me, at least, making my statement here with a deliberation which I had never made it, the whole feeling of the moment returns. It was as if, while I took it in, what I did take in, all the rest of the scene had been stricken with death. I can hear it again as I write, the intense hush at which the sounds of the evening drop. The rooks stop calling in the golden sky, and the friendly hour lost, for the minute, all its voice. But there was no other change in nature, unless indeed it were a change that I saw with a stranger sharpness. The gold was in the sky, the clearness in the air, and the man who looked at me over the battlements was as definite as a picture in a frame. That's how I thought, with extraordinary quickness, of each person that he might have been, and that he was not. We were confronted across our distance quite long enough for me to ask myself with intensity who then he was and to feel, as an effect of my inability to say, a wonder that in a few instants more became intense. The great question, or one of these, is afterwards I know, with regard to certain matters, the question of how long they have lasted. Well, this matter of mine, think of it what you will, lasted while I caught it a dozen possibilities, none of which made a difference for the better that I could see in their having been in the house, and for how long, above all, a person of whom I was in ignorance. It lasted while I just bridled a little with the sense that my office demanded that there should be no such ignorance and no such person. It lasted while this visitant, at all events, and there was a touch of the strange freedom, as I remember, in the sign of familiarity of his wearing no hat, scandalous, seemed to fix me from his position with just the question, just the scrutiny through the fading light that his own presence provoked. We were too far apart to call to each other, but there was a moment at which, at a shorter range, some challenge between us breaking the hush would have been the right result of our straight mutual stare. He was in one of the angles, the one away from the house, very erect, as it struck me, and with both his hands on the ledge. So I saw him as I see the letters I form on this page. Then, exactly after a minute, as if to add to the spectacle, he slowly changed his place, passed, looking at me hard all the while, to the opposite corner of the platform. Yes, I had the sharpest sense that during this transit he never took his eyes from me, and I can see at this moment the way his hand, as he went, passed from one of the crenellations to the next. He stopped at the other corner, but less long, and even as he turned away still markedly fixed me, he turned away. That was all I knew. Dun dun dun. The Turn of the Screw, Chapter 4 it was not that I didn't wait on this occasion for more, for I was rooted as deeply as I was shaken. Was there a secret, Epli? A mystery of Udolpho, or an unmentionable relative kept in unsuspected confinement? I can't say how long I turned it over, or how long, in a confusion of curiosity and dread, I remained where I had had my collision. I only recall that when I re-entered the house, darkness had quite closed in. Agitation in the interval certainly had held me and driven me, for I must, in circling about the place, have walked three miles. But I was to be, later on, so much more overwhelmed that this mere dawn of alarm was a comparatively human chill. The most singular part of it, in fact, singular as the rest had been, was the part that I became, in the hall, aware of in meeting Mrs. Gross. The picture comes back to me in a general train, the impression as I received it on my return, of the wide, white-paneled space, bright in the lamplight and with its portraits and red carpet, and the good surprise look of my friend, which immediately told me she had missed me. It came to me straight away, under her contact, that, with plain heartiness, mere relieved anxiety at my appearance, she knew nothing whatever that could bear upon the incident I had ready there for her. I had not suspected in advance that her comfortable face would pull me up, and I somehow measured the importance of what I had seen by my thus finding myself hesitate to mention it. Scarce anything in the whole history seems to me so odd as this fact that my real beginning of fear was one, as I may say, with the instinct of sparing my companion. 
on the spot, accordingly, in the pleasant hall and with her eyes on me, I, for a reason that I couldn't then have phrased, achieved an inward resolution, offered vague pretext for my lateness, and, with the plea of the beauty of the night and the heavy dew and wet feet, went as soon as possible to my room. Oh no, you have to confide in Mrs. Gross. You could solve this mystery together. Faster, I'm sure of it. Here it was another affair. Here, for many days after, it was an odd affair enough. There were hours from day to day, or at least there were moments snatched even from clear duties when I had to shut myself up to think. It was not so much yet that I was more nervous than I could bear to be, as that I was remarkably afraid of becoming so. For the truth I had now to turn over was, simply and clearly, the truth that I could arrive at no account whatever of the visitor with whom I had been so inexplicably and yet, as it seemed to me, so intimately concerned. It took little time to see that I should sound without complicated forms of inquiry and without exciting remark any domestic complications. The shock I had suffered must have sharpened all my senses. I felt sure at the end of three days and as the result of mere closer attention that I had not been practiced upon by the servants nor made the object of any game. Of whatever it was that I knew, nothing was known around me. There was one bit of sane inference. Someone had taken a liberty rather gross. That was what repeatedly I dipped into my room and locked the door to say to myself. We had been collectively subject to an intrusion. Some unscrupulous traveler, curious in old houses, had made his way in, unobserved, enjoyed the prospect from the best point of view, and then stolen out as he came. If he had given me such a bold, hard stare, that was but a part of his indiscretion. The good thing, after all, was that we should surely see no more of him. One can hope. One can only hope. This was not so good a thing, I admit, as not to leave me to judge what, essentially, made nothing else much signify was simply my charming work. My charming work was just my life with Miles and Flora, and through nothing could I so like it as through feeling that I could throw myself into it in trouble. The attraction of my small charges was a constant joy, leading me to wonder afresh at the vanity of my original fears. The distaste I had begun by entertaining for the probable grey prose of my office. There was to be no grey prose, it appeared, and no long grind, so how could work not be charming that presented itself as daily beauty? It was all the romance of nursery and the poetry of the schoolroom. I don't mean by this, of course, that we studied only fiction and verse. I mean I can express no otherwise the sort of interest my companions inspired. How can I describe that except by saying that instead of growing used to them, and it's a marvel for a governess I call the sisterhood to witness, I made constant fresh discoveries. There was one direction assuredly in which these discoveries stopped. Deep obscurity continued to cover the region of the boy's conduct at school. It had been promptly given me, I have noted, to face that mystery without a pang. Perhaps even it would be nearer the truth to say that, without a word, he himself had cleared it up. He had made the whole charge absurd. My conclusion bloomed there with the real rose flush of his innocence. He was only too fine and fair for the little horrid, unclean school world, and he had paid a price for it. I reflected acutely that the sense of such differences, such superiorities of quality, always on the part of the majority, which could include even stupid, sordid headmasters, turn infallibly to the vindictive. Wow, she really makes its excuses for him, I feel. So she blames his behavior on the school and the schoolmasters, maybe. Maybe because he's too pretty to do anything bad? And his spirit's also pretty? Got it. Both the children had a gentleness, it was their only fault, and it never made Miles a muff, that kept them, how shall I express it, almost impersonal and certainly quite unpunishable. They were like the cherubs of the antidote, who had, morally at any rate, nothing to whack. I remember feeling with Miles in especial that if he had had, as it were, no history, that's quite scary. We expect of a small child a scant one, but there was in this beautiful little boy something extraordinarily sensitive, yet extraordinarily happy that, more than in any creature of his age I have seen, struck me as beginning anew each day. He had never for a second suffered. I took this as a direct disproof of his having really been chastised. 
If he had been wicked, he would have caught it, and I should have caught it by the rebound. I should have found the trace. I found nothing at all, and he was therefore an angel. He never spoke of his school, never mentioned a comrade or a master, and I, for my part, was quite too much disgusted to allude to them. Of course, I was under the spell, and the wonderful part is, even at the time, I perfectly knew I was. But I gave myself up to it. It was an antidote to any pain, and I had more pains than one. I was in receipt these days of disturbing letters from home, where things were not going well. But with my children, what things in the world mattered? That was the question I used to put my scrappy retirements. I was dazzled by their loveliness. There was a Sunday, to get on, when it rained with such force and for so many hours that there could be no procession to church, in consequence of which, as the day declined, I had arranged with Mrs. Gross that, should the evening show improvement, we would attend together the late service. The rain happily stopped and I prepared for our walk, which, through the park and by the good road to the village, would be a matter of twenty minutes. Coming downstairs to meet my colleague in the hall, I remembered a pair of gloves that had required three stitches and that had received them, with a publicity perhaps not edifying, while I sat with the children at their tea, served on Sundays by exception in that cold, clean temple of mahogany and brass, the grown-up dining room. The gloves had been dropped there, and I turned in to recover them. The day was not gray enough, but the afternoon light still lingered, and it enabled me, on crossing the threshold, not only to recognize on a chair near the wide window, then closed, the articles I wanted, but to become aware of a person on the other side of the window and looking straight in. One step into the room had sufficed. My vision was instantaneous. It was all there. The person looking straight in was the person who had already appeared to me. He appeared thus again with, I won't say greater distinctness, for that was impossible, but with a nearness that represented a forward stride in our intercourse and made me, as I met him, catch my breath and turn cold. He was the same. He was the same and seen this time, as he had been before from the waist up. The window, though the dining room was on the ground floor, not going down to the terrace on which he stood. His face was close to the glass, yet the effect of this better view was, strangely, only to show me how intense the former had been. He remained but for a few seconds, long enough to convince me that he also saw and recognized. But it was as if I had been looking at him for years and had known him always. Something, however, happened this time that had not happened before. His stare into my face, through the glass and across the room, was as deep and hard as then, but it quitted me for a moment during which I could still watch it, see it fix successively several other things. On the spot there came to me the added shock of a certitude that it was not for me that he had come there, he had come for someone else. The flash of this knowledge, for it was knowledge in the midst of dread, produced in me the most extraordinary effect. Started as I stood there a sudden vibration of duty and courage. I say courage because I was beyond all doubt already far gone. I bounded straight out of the door again, reached that of the house, got in an instant upon the drive and passing along the terrace as fast as I could rush, turned a corner and came in full sight. But it was in sight of nothing now. My visitor had vanished. I stopped. I almost dropped with the relief of this. But I took the whole scene. I gave him time to reappear. I call it time, but how long was it? I can't speak to the purpose today of the duration of these things. That kind of measure must have left me. They couldn't have lasted as they actually appeared to me to last. The terrace and the whole place, the lawn and the garden beyond it, all I could see of the park were empty with a great emptiness. There were shrubberies and big trees, but I remember the clear assurance I felt that none of them concealed him. He was there or not there, not there if I didn't see him. I got hold of this then instinctively, instead of returning as I had come, went to the window. It was confusedly present to me that I ought to place myself where he had stood, so I did. I applied my face to the pane and looked as he had looked into the room, as if at this moment to show me exactly what his range had been. Mrs. Gross, as I had done for himself just before, came in from the hall. With this, I had the full image of a repetition of which it had already occurred. 
She saw me as I had seen my own visitant. She pulled up short as I had done. I gave her something of the shock that I had received. She turned white, and this made me ask myself if I had blanched as much. She started in short and retreated on just my lines, and I knew she had then passed out and come round to me and that I should presently meet her. I remained where I was, and while I waited I thought of more things than one, but there's only one I take space to mention. I wondered why she should be scared. Dun dun dun. I will say she was very brave to go chasing the man that she saw in the window on her own, just like, I gotta go protect the kids. Let's go find out who he is and confront him. That was quite brave. And that also leads us to the turn of the screw, chapter five. Oh, she let me know as soon as, round the corner of the house, she loomed again into view. What in the name of goodness is the matter? She was now flushed and out of breath. I said nothing till she came quite near. With me, I must have made a wonderful face. Do I show it? You're as white as a sheet, you look awful. I considered, I can meet on this without a scruple, any innocence. My need to respect the bloom of Mrs. Gross's had dropped without a rustle from my shoulders. And if I wavered for the instant, it was not with what I kept back. I put my hand out to her and she took it. I held her heart a little, liking to feel her close to me. Oh, my... There was a kind of support in the shy heave of her surprise. You came for me for church, of course, but I can't go. Has anything happened? Yes, you must know now. Did I look very strange? Through the window? Dreadful. Well, I said, I've been frightened. Mrs. Gross's eyes expressed plainly that she had no wish to be, yet also that she knew too well her place was not to be ready to share with me any marked inconvenience. Oh, it was quite settled that she must share. Just what you saw from the dining room a minute ago was the effect of that. What I saw just before was much worse. Her hand tightened. What was it? An extraordinary man looking in. An extraordinary man? I haven't the least idea. Mrs. Gross gazed round us in vain. Then where is he gone? I know still less. Have you seen him before? Yes, once, on the old tower. She could only look at me harder. Do you mean he's a stranger? Oh, very much. You didn't tell me. No, for reasons. But now that you've guessed, Mrs. Gross's round eyes encountered this charge. Ah, uh, I haven't guessed, she said very simply. How can I if you don't imagine? I don't in the very least. You've seen him nowhere but on the tower. And on this spot just now, Mrs. Gross looked round again. What was he doing on the tower? only standing there and looking down at me. She thought a minute. Was he a gentleman? I found I had no need to think. No. She gazed deeper in wonder. No. Then nobody about the place? Nobody from the village? Nobody, nobody, I didn't tell you, but I made sure. She breathed a vague relief. This was, oddly, so much to the good. It only went indeed a little way. But if he isn't a gentleman, what is he? He's a horror. A horror? He's, God help me if I know what he is. Mrs. Gross looked round once more. She fixed her eyes on the duskier distance, then, pulling herself together, turned to me with abrupt inconsequence. It's time we should be at church. Oh, I'm not fit for church. Won't it do you good? It won't do them, I nodded at the house. The children, I can't leave them now. You're afraid, I spoke boldly. I'm afraid of him. Mrs. Gross's large face showed me, at this, for the first time, the faraway faint glimmer of a consciousness more acute. I somehow made out in the delayed dawn of an idea I myself had not given her, and that was as yet quite obscure to me. It comes back to me that I thought instantly of this as something that I could get from her, and I felt it to be connected with the desire she presently showed to know more. When was this, on the tower? About the middle of the month, at this same hour. Almost at dark, said Mrs. Gross. Oh no, not nearly. I saw him as I see you. Then how did he get in? And how did he get out? I laughed. I had no opportunity to ask him. This evening, you see, I pursued, he has not been able to get in. He only peeps. I hope it will be confined to that. She had now let go my hand. She turned away a little. I waited an instant, then I brought out. 
go to church. Goodbye, I must watch. Slowly, she faced me again. Do you fear for them? We met in another long look. Don't you? Instead of answering, she came nearer to the window and, for a minute, supplied her face to the glass. You see how he could see, I meanwhile went on. She didn't move. How long was he here? Till I came out, I came to meet him. Mrs. Gross at last turned round and there was still more in her face. I couldn't have come out. Neither could I, I laughed again, but I did come, I have my duty. So I have mine, she replied, after which she added, what is he like? I've been dying to tell you, but he's like nobody. Nobody, she echoed. He has no hat. Then, seeing in her face that she already, in this, with a deeper dismay, found a touch of a picture, I quickly added, stroke to stroke, he has red hair, very red, close curling and a pale face, long in shape, with straight, good features, and little, rather odd whiskers that are as red as his hair. His eyebrows are, somehow, darker, and they look particularly arched as if they might move a good deal. His eyes are sharp, strange, awfully but I only know clearly that they're rather small and very fixed. His mouth is wide, his lips are thin, and except for his little whiskers, he's quite clean-shaven. It gives me a sort of sense of looking like an actor. An actor? It was impossible to resemble one less, at least in Mrs. Gross at that moment. I've never seen one, so I suppose them. He's tall, active, erect, I continued, but never, no, never a gentleman. My companion's face has blanched as I went on. Her round eyes started and her mild mouth gaped. A gentleman? She gasped, confounded, stupefied. A gentleman, he? You know him then? She visibly tried to hold herself. But he is handsome? I saw the way to help her. Remarkably. And dressed in somebody's clothes. They're smart, but they're not his own. She broke into a breathless affirmative groan. They're the masters. I caught it up. You do know him. She faltered but a second. Quint, she cried. Quint? Peter Quint, his own man, his valet, when he was here. When the master was? Gaping still, but meeting me, she pieced it all together. He never wore his hat, but he did wear... Well, there were waistcoats missed. They were both here last year. Then the master went, and Quint was alone. I followed but halting a little. Alone? Alone with us. Then, as from a deeper depth, in charge, she added. And what became of him? She hung fire so long that I was still more mystified. He went, too, she brought out at last. Went where? Her expression at this became extraordinary. God knows where. He died. Died? I almost shrieked. She seemed fairly to square herself, plant herself more firmly to utter the wonder of it. Yes, Mr. Quint is dead. Dun dun dun. And on that fatal note, we are closing tonight's telling of The Turn of the Screw, part 2, which was chapters or parts 3, 4, and 5. I do hope you enjoyed the telling of it. We have quite a mystery on our hand with dead people reappearing in windows and uncrenellated towers. And we're only just beginning. Do stay tuned for part three, which will be a few more chapters coming soon. And do stick around tonight if you need more videos. We've got a lot at this point. But now, off to sleep and dream what you will, or stay a while and enjoy another tale. Whichever you choose, I'll speak to you again. And until then, stay spooky, my friends. Good night.